Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first Duke DC Career Conversation. I'm Lauren Menkes, Trinity 83, Parent 24, and a Duke DC board member representing Demon, the acronym for Duke Entertainment Media and Arts Network. Today's session is the launch of Duke DC's Career Conversations, modeled after Duke New York. We are very fortunate to have Holly Morris, Pratt 93, speak with us about her exciting career in broadcast journalism. Holly is also a member of the Pratt Board of Visitors and Women's Impact Network. Everyone, please remain on mute with cameras off for the first 15 minutes. You may post your questions for Holly in the chat, which I'll ask Holly at our midway point. As a bonus treat, Holly has generously offered to stay past the half hour mark to answer all your questions. So let's begin. Holly, thank you for speaking with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, you know, talking about Duke is one of my favorite things to talk about in the whole world. So I never have a problem doing that. I'm so happy to hear that. Congratulations, by the way, on your 22 year anniversary this week at Fox 5 DC. That's a fantastic achievement. I know, it's pretty crazy. I can't believe that I've been here more than two decades. And in this day and age, it doesn't seem like people stay in one place that long anymore. Exactly. Um, but, uh, but it's an achievement and I I'll take that. I'll take that, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful to be able to have longevity like that, especially in a career um, like mine where turnover is pretty great. It is incredible. Before we dive into questions from our audience, would you please walk us through your amazing journey from a Duke student to being an on-camera news reporter and co-host? You don't think that it seems obvious just to go from the Duke Engineering School to Fox 5? <laughs> the number one question I get all the time when, when people um, find out that I went to engineering school, they're like, what? you're an engineer, which is slightly offensive. I'm like, what do you mean? I don't, you don't think I look like an engineer? Um, it always takes me back to a paper that I wrote while I was at Duke that was titled, you know, all blondes aren't dizzy. Um, but my journey from Duke to where I am now makes perfect sense when you really think about it. So I grew up in a suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio, and I went to public high school. And, um, but I did really well in school and I was fortunate enough. I was valedictorian of my class when I graduated and I really wanted to go somewhere where you achieve something just by getting in. Now, having said that, getting in back then is not like getting into Duke today. I am glad that I got in when I did. <laughs> not so sure I would make the grade uh, today, <laughs> but, but, at that time, um, I was fortunate and my dad said to me, Holly, you can go to school anywhere, anywhere you can get in, you've earned the right to go there. And we did all the tours and went on campus. And when I walked on Duke's campus, I just saw myself there. I knew that's the place that I wanted to be. I also was really math and science oriented. And I, like many kids, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do, but I did have a huge interest in the news, even at a young age. And I just liked being in the know. I liked being up to date and being informed and asking questions. I had a natural curiosity. Um, so my dad said to me, Holly, what you need to do is go to school, get an education, and then be anything you want to be. And so I really took that to heart. But at the same time, he said, you need a backup plan. Um, making it in TV news is, is not the easiest thing. The reality is sometimes you just have to be in the right place at the right time with the look that they want. And that's just how it works. So there are a lot of people that try and um, then decide that it's not what they wanna do. Um, entry level TV jobs don't pay very much. So the thing about TV is it doesn't pay very much in the beginning, but you have a chance to have a really nice career if you stick with it and continue to move up in market size and, and have success. So having said all that, I thought, you know what? Engineering is a good 
backup plan for me in the fact that if I don't want to do news anymore, I can, you know, build you a damn bridge, city planning, whatever comes along um, with my environmental engineering degree. But the truth of the matter is too, not just in, did it give me a really nice profession as a second option? The truth about engineering is, and, and I will take this to my grave, it teaches you how to think and it teaches you how to solve problems and it teaches you how to take in massive amounts of information and process it. And I do that every day. And I would do that in whatever career I went into. So if I had to go back and do it again, I would go to engineering school because it just, it gives you the tools to be successful. And the thing about a Duke engineering degree is it's such a holistic degree. Um, I always use the example. I remember when I was there, them telling us this, that you know, NC State has a wonderful engineering school, but they have a different philosophy, right? So they might have a 16 week course on surveying. At Duke, surveying would be a part of a course and they would teach you the philosophy and the concept and the importance of surveying, but you wouldn't need to spend a lot of time, 16 weeks learning the tools of the trade then because technology is always gonna change and how they survey and the tools they use to survey are gonna change and you're gonna continually relearn that over and over, but you just have to understand the why. And so that's what I thought was so valuable about Duke engineering. And I will say, and then I always say, I did take a course in sludge management and in news, you deal with that. Take that as you want. Figuratively <laughs> and literally, right? <laughs> so anyway, I graduated from um, Duke. I had a wonderful time there um, and just my education, I just can't even put a price tag on, on what it taught me while I was there. Then I had to get my first job. I graduated. I went back home to Cincinnati. The main anchor for one of the stations in Cincinnati was a Duke grad. Her name is Carol Williams. I cold called her and introduced myself as a Duke student. And she got me an internship just because of that. And so I then got hired on there. Uh, I worked the weekend assignment desk and I did some uh, background work for their investigative journalism department. Then, you know, I worked on getting my tape together um, and sent out resume tapes. And the first place that hired me was a WTOV in Steubenville, Ohio. Don't be jealous. Um, birthplace of Dean Martin. And I got hired there to actually be the morning producer. And so I would produce the morning newscast and then I would go out and report. And on my second day there, they had like an historic snowstorm and I was out reporting live for my first time in inches of snow. And I was there seven months and then I started to send out tapes again and I got hired at WKYT in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, which was a wonderful, wonderful station. I was the police reporter there uh, and then got uh, promoted to morning anchor and I was morning anchor there for four years. And then I made the jump from Lexington to Washington DC in uh, December of 1998. And I was a freelance reporter at first and I was out on the street just covering breaking news. Then I actually fell into a role um, Tony Perkins was at my station at the time, and he actually got hired uh, by Good Morning America to be to take the place of Spencer Christian. And Tony was this really well-known feature, live feature reporter here in the Washington area. And so then when he left to go to Good Morning America, they needed someone to kind of fill in that role. And I fell into that. And that really is what I did at Channel 5 for 17 years. I was on location um, and I was always interactive, live, doing fun things um, that were going on in and around, you know, the DMV. Then I moved into morning anchoring and then we started this show called Good Day DC, which is kind of like a lifestyle show. And I became one of those hosts. So, and I've been doing that now, maybe five or six years or so. It kind of all runs together when you've been there 22 years, you know. It's unbelievable. It is. It, 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 about, like waking up so early that, you, I mean, you start before, I mean, when we're still in our REM sleep, you're, oh. you're, you're already on camera. 
Right. But what is that like? Like, how have you adjusted? So, so I've been up since 2 a.m. That's what time I get up. And <laughs> so, and I work, I get to the studio at three and we go on the air at four and then we're on for seven hours. So 4 a.m. to 11 a.m. Then we have, you know, post-show meetings. And um, so basically I work like 3 a.m. to noonish, 11.30 noon. Now in this pandemic world, you know, we don't do any meetings in person anymore. So I actually can leave and, you know, you do it via Zoom on your phone and everything. Um, that might be a silver lining from the pandemic <laughs> because sometimes, wow. yeah, those post-show meetings at the station could last a long time. Um, so uh, what I always say is you don't, I, you just learn how to function tired. That, that's, you know what I mean? You just, cause it's not ever normal to get up at 2 a.m. It's just not. And then, you know, I mean, I have a family, right? So I try to, I try if I can to get a nap in here or there. Some days I get a nap in, some days, you know, life happens, right? And, and, and then my family doesn't work on my schedule or the rest of the world doesn't work on that schedule. So I still have dinner at a normal time and, you know, uh, try to help, you know, I put my son to bed. Luckily, I, I'm an old mom. So I have a young kid for my age. My little boy just turned nine. And so he still goes to bed relatively early. And so he goes to bed and then I go to bed. So Who goes to bed first. You were <laughs> well, many in all honesty, a lot of times it's um, at the same time. So we always read together when he goes to bed and I generally fall asleep in his bed and he falls asleep. And then my husband comes and wakes me up a little later and says, okay, come on over. So I usually, I, I usually get about five hours of sleep. I sleep like nine to two. That's my normal. And then I try to get a nap in if I can. Wow. You're such a hard worker. Well, we know that one of the challenges of being a broadcast journalist is your schedule. Are there any other challenges, uh, you know, that you faced other than just the, the odd, this lack of sleep? Oh yeah. And you know, the lack of sleeping, I think you you set your mind, right? You're either going to let it be an issue or not let it be an issue. I think you really, it's just, if you dwell on it, it could, it could be really depressing, but you don't dwell on it. It's right. fine. And the beauty of it is, see, I actually think my schedule is perfect for my family because the only thing I miss is the morning and that's my husband and my son's time. And, and, you know, he gets them ready for school and takes them to school and, and all of that. And, but I'm, I pick them up from school and I'm there for every afternoon activity and I'm there in the evening for dinner and I'm there for bedtime. And so, I mean, I might be sleeping while I'm sitting up. I might be sleeping right now. You would never know, but I don't miss anything. And so that's, that's means a lot to me. It, it means a lot to me. Other challenges. I, you know, you know, all jobs have challenges. I think um, if I had to pick one challenge that I think um, is something that is taxing is um, social media. Um, there's a lot of pressure to uh, do social media. I think that um, social media is not good for news in a lot of ways. It is good, obviously it can get information out quickly, um, but it also gets a lot of misinformation out very quickly. Um, and there's just a lot of reaction uh, to what people do and say, and it snowballs and things get out of control very, very quickly. And there also is just not a lot of vetting of the news. And there's a lot of opinion based news. And I, th I think hands down, that is uh, the most challenging thing right now for me. I, I would also say so I'm, I ride that line, right? So I'm kind of like old school, but I'm not super old. <laughs> but um, so, but I'm competing with other journalists who are willing to put things on Instagram that I'm not willing to put on Instagram and uh, all in an effort to get viewers and get likes. And um, so I, I feel like there's been a line that has been blurred that is not good for the career. Yeah. What about the pressure of just, you are a celebrity and you know, people notice you, do you, you know, how is that life being so famous? 
you know, and no. has it, does it, like, it, do you, are you okay with the fact that wherever you go, you're recognized? Do you love that? Or does it sometimes make you feel uncomfortable? You know, I mean, I'm not super famous, so let's not. Well, in this area. But, but there, are, there are, you know, people that, that recognize me. Um, it doesn't bother me unless people are disrespectful, you know, and they come up in, I mean, if you're, if I'm clearly having a family time and someone comes up and then hangs on and doesn't walk away, I mean, that can, can get a little annoying, but I have to say, I don't, I don't really find it to be a huge, huge problem. Um, I'm appreciative of people that come up and say things because if I don't have viewers, I don't have a job. So I also always try to keep that in mind, right? Um, I think the the biggest concern I have with that is just um, there are crazy people out there, um, and so uh, would be like for the safety of my son, um, in terms of like I don't like this is one of those social media things, right? So you know, there's always this big pressure, like okay, everybody post your kids' first day of school pictures, and and we're going to try to get viewers to send in the first day of school pictures. And so I have to be very conscious, or at least I choose to be, like I would never post where my child goes to school. So I would try to take like a generic picture of him just like in his stuff. And so I try to balance those kind of things because I don't want, um, I don't want something to happen. So, um, and then we've had, I mean, we've had instances where there's been, um, you know, sometimes people, and, and, and I will say social media also enables this, you know, someone can become hyper-focused on you and they also feel like they have access to you. And um, so we've had a couple of those situations where, but the station's really good and we have great security um, with the network and stuff. And they, they stay on top of that and monitor all that. But that can be a little unnerving when they notify you that, hey, we just want you to know this person's, you know, kind of latched on to you. Um, and that's happened a couple of times, but I, but for the most part, if you're just talking about the general person that comes up and says, hey, I love watching you in the morning, I'm always grateful and appreciative of that. And flipping the side of celebrity, you've interviewed so many famous people in all walks of life. Do you have any favorites you'd like to share with us? You know, I get this question a lot. It's so hard because um, one of the things I love most about living in Washington is just all the different people that come through here. Uh, you know, it's not just Hollywood. It's not just politicians. It's uh, NASA engineers. And, you know, I, I mean, it's just, it's just this treasure trove of smart people that come through here. And so there's so many great conversations to be had. And when I think about this question, like there are times when I think, one of my favorites, and this is never exciting to, to a lot of people, but when I used to go out and about, I used to be live at the Kennedy Center all the time because, you know, different people were coming through. And one morning I got to spend the morning with Marvin Hamlish and he, so it was so great because at that time I would just do certain segments with him, like maybe one an hour. Right. So in the meantime, you know, if you're familiar with the Kennedy Center and there's the big hall and the Millennium stages are, you know, on either end, we were literally just sitting on the floor. He's reading the paper. He's telling us all these stories about, you know, this time when Barbara Streisand called or this time. And he's telling us all the behind the scenes stories. And then he was, he's like, Hey, let's go up to the piano. And he went up to the piano. And when I was in, sixth grade chorus, we sang, you know, sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. And that's one of the early on songs that he had written. And I knew that, but, and so I just started singing that and he just started playing it and he couldn't believe that I knew that song. And it was just such a um, endearing moment. I always remember that time with Marvin Hamlish, but then there's also crazy, like, you know, Fox network, um, said, hey, we're gonna have this little summer replacement show and we're gonna take the top 10 reporters from the top 10 markets and fly you guys out to California because we want you to cover it. We don't know if it's gonna be a hit or not, but um, we're gonna pay for you to come out here. It's, it's called American Idol. And so I went out to LA, there was this, you know, summer replacement show. They're like, well, we want you to have dinner with Simon Cowell. And so, you know, and here, we want you to spend the afternoon with Ryan Seacrest. All these people that then, of course, American Idol blew up and became this 
phenom, you know, so then you have things like that or you get to be with the players when the caps win the Stanley cup or the Nats win the world series. I mean, it's just never ending, but some of the most memorable things for me have been the people that aren't the celebrities. Um, the, the people that are making a difference in this world, just because their heart is huge or their passion is great. Um, this one lady, I, Chanel Leak, she just left such a stamp on my heart because she um, started this charity and, and I did a story on her when she first started it. And she creates custom birthday parties for for kids in homeless shelters that are with like, a lot of them have, you know, they're single moms. But what she does is she, she meets with the mom and everything and she finds out specifically about that child. It's, so it's not like this just packaged, you know, party kit that she puts together. She does something personal for that kid and, and she gets them a gift. She has decorations. They literally go into the homeless shelter and they throw the children the party. But here's the greatest thing she lets the kid think the mom does it. So she takes no credit for it. But so, so here's this mom that has nothing in a homeless shelter throwing a birthday party for her child and the child's thinking the mom's doing it. And, and Chanel's just like, cause you know, the thing about a birthday is that's the day where you realize you matter and every child should feel like they matter, right? And she gives them a photo book and everything. And it's this charity called Extraordinary Birthdays. And I just thought that was so yes. extraordinary. Well, she went on to become like L'Oreal named her like woman of the year. I mean, she again went on to become this huge thing. And I did her story um, early on. And so to be able to meet people like that, like if I just had a, if I did just have an engineering job in an office where I went every day and I was working on plans or whatever, I'm not going to meet people like that. Right. And so um, those are the kind of things that really, I think, mean the most, though, I will say the other cool thing with my job is you really get amazing access. So I always tell about the time when I get to go like behind the scenes as a Smithsonian. So, you know, the Smithsonian's amazing. And, but, you know, everything that's on display is only like 1% of their actual collection, right? And so there are times when I got to go like in four vaults in where the gyms are at the Natural History Museum. And the guy that's the curator of the gyms is like, oh, here. And he just opens this drawer and he's like, this is a tiara from the Queen of Spain back in, you know, whatever. And um, so just to like see things like that is, is pretty amazing, pretty amazing. fun. Yeah. Well, we are um, at 523 and you have generously offered to stay past 530. I know we need you. So please stay with us because we're now um, past the halfway point. If anyone doesn't have their camera on and they want to put their camera on, please feel free because I would love to see all her fellow Duke alumni. And I'm going to start asking um, questions from our incredible audience. Um, one of which I think many people are interested in, if it's not for them or relative or one of their uh, Duke students, do you have advice for people that want to do what you do and break into this fantastic career? Because it, it's not easy. Um, and, you know, what advice would you have for a young alumni or a Duke student? Like, what are the best steps in terms of classes maybe at Duke and what to do in terms of internships or summer jobs to get them prepared? Well, I think um, all the classes at the Pratt School of Engineering are the ones you need to take. <laughs> <laughs> I might be slightly biased, um, but no. So, you know what? Actually, what I would say is I will go back to what my dad originally said to me, you know what, get an education and then be anything you want to be. The wonderful thing about Duke is, is there's so many opportunities there. I would say take as many classes in as many things as you can, because what I find in news is that on any given day, I have to know um, a little bit about a lot 
right? And so I always say I, I'm like the jack of all trades, master of nothing. But but I know a lot about a lot of different things. And then obviously you, in this day and age, it's so easy to go and, and find out more. So, um, but just learn as much as you can to, you know, take in as much as you can, um, because no other time in your life are you going to be in a place where you have access to that amount of knowledge. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, usually you're independent at someone else's expense. So take advantage of it while you're, while you're, while you're in school. Um, but other than that, you know, uh, it's interesting now with news because a lot of people get big time jobs because they um, have done something else already, right? So uh, a former professional athlete um, becomes something, George Stephanopoulos, right? Like, uh, you know, former politician or, you know, in political aid becomes a news person. Um, if you do it the old fashioned way, like I did, I highly recommend starting in a small market and working your way up because you can make all your mistakes in a small market and the stakes aren't as great, but you also do more in a small market because the resources aren't there, right? So when I was in Steubenville, Ohio, or, and I'm producing the morning news, um, I <laughs> would come into the station, I made the coffee, and then I also um, you know, wrote all the stories, I edited all the tapes, when the newscast was on, I back-timed by hand, and I learned all of those jobs, and I learned how it all goes together, and what I have found is that as you go up the ranks and do that, the people then that have those other jobs, the editors of the world, the photographers of the world, the writers, the producers, because you know and respect what they do, they respect you. And so you're not just talent. You're not just a talking head. And, um, and I have found, because I do work with people that started in Washington, DC, um, that the level of respect is different. And I think that that really means a lot. And I think also that that has attributed to my longevity at Channel 5 because I have a true respect and understanding for the team. And it, and it takes a team. And I don't think just because I'm the person you see on TV, that doesn't make me the most important person by far in terms of putting on that newscast. Great answer. Thank you so much. We got a, another question about um, engineering, which you'll love. Is have you done actual engineering related stories or, or, you know, for Fox 5 or Good Day DC, or has it been assigned to someone else? And you said, I want to do it because I have the engineering degree. Like, have you actually done stories or is it really just more in the background of your skill set? Oh, no, no, no. I definitely have done so. I mean, anytime there's a chemical spill or any environmental problem or, a, a, Lord, traffic in DC, you know, traffic patterns, designing, uh, I mean, all of that come, all of that comes into play. And generally speaking, um, when there's any kind of science story, they give it to me. So I don't, I, I um, especially in the mornings with, with the group that I work with. So um, <laughs> I, I haven't too many times had to say, hey, why don't you have me do it? They usually they say, know. Hey, yeah, Holly, why don't you do it? That, that's that's usually great. What happens. I let someone else handle, you know, the Kardashians and I handle, you know, science stuff. Great. Um, someone else is asking about mentorship. Did you have special mentors? Um, and um, how, are you a mentor to students? So what is that relationship? Could you talk more about that? Yeah, well, you can never underestimate the power of a good mentor, um, for sure. And so I definitely, um, if you've been in Washington for a long time you and, and, and watch Channel 5, you would know Lark McCarthy. She um, originated the morning news program there and was the anchor there for a long, long time. And she, when I started, she was the anchor and she has been um, a long time mentor of mine um, and a go-to person. And I can't even 
<laughs> put a value on my relationship with her because she ha helps me professionally, but also personally in my profession at the same time, um, which is kind of two different things because navigating um, the world is a, in, in the newsroom as a woman and, you know, it has its challenges. And so she was someone that has done that and did it very successfully and um, always had such wonderful advice and just having her there in my world. I mean, even now, I mean, I, I reach out to her uh, now uh, all the time, even with the, because news is, it's been ever changing. And so the challenges are different and she's helped me with those challenges. With hands down, I mentor any and everybody that asks me to, that I feel like I can help because I think that um, it, it's important to, you know, um, to, to pay it forward. And um, people helped me. And so it, I wouldn't be where I am if people didn't take the time to help me through or answer my questions. So it would, it would seem pretty selfish of me to not do that. And the thing is, is that one of the things I love most about um, even being on the, the board of visitors at the Pratt School is the interaction with the young people, right? Like when you go back to campus and the, and the students come and they talk and they present, I mean, that, that's our future and just I find that that is exciting and to have this uh, a young person in front of you that wants to do and be and why wouldn't you help that why, why wouldn't you help so I guess it's okay if you get uh, emails from our audience members or people that watch a recording that would be incredible Holly thank you so much my pleasure I've never turned down anybody that's asked for help I will say oh, that thank you that's incredible so we have another question from a recent young alum who said, were there early mistakes that you made in your career that taught you some lessons that you would like to share with um, the young alumni on this call or listening to the recording that, um, you know, just some words of wisdom, you know, maybe things that you were hard on yourself about or, you know, you neglected to think of or, you know, that, you know, to help them maybe skip a step or handle it with, with more ease and comfort. So the single biggest mistake probably throughout my career would be any given hairstyle that I've had at, at a certain time. So the thing about being in news is that you definitely have your whole career <laughs> to look at. Um, <laughs> no, I, you your know, headshot, it, it's fabulous, by the way, the recent one, I absolutely adore it. It took decades to get that great headshot. <laughs> Find a photographer. I need this name <laughs> afterwards. Um, so, you know, here's the thing about mistakes. I mean, I, you know, when I was listening to you ask that question, I was trying to think of mistakes that I would have want to skip. And um, I don't think there's been any mistake that I would want to skip because mistakes are how you grow and it, it, it kind of goes back to that when I the value of starting in the small market um it, you know you can't just arrive you know my dad used to always say to me you know Holly it takes at least 10 years to be an overnight success and, um, you know I I think that the biggest thing I would say is you you do just need to know where you can make the mistakes. That's why I think it's important to start important to start in a small market because there's not much as at stake. Of course, you can't make those mistakes in in Market Seven, Washington D.C. that you can make in Market One Forty Five in in, in Steubenville, Ohio. So you do um, need need to be aware of that. I think um, as much you know it as much as I love being at channel five for 22 years and and, and that makes its own statement um i think you know sometimes i think well should i have tried to go to the network should i've tried to do that maybe i but i would have need to have done that earlier so my suggestion would be if you are someone that has a, a certain place you want to arrive in TV, you need to just keep moving. You got to keep that momentum going forward, um, and you know, and, and not stop. Um, not to say that stopping is bad, because if I 
if I walked away from my TV career today, I, I would have no regrets. I, I, I've done lots of wonderful things and, and it has been a very rewarding career for me. Um, but I would give that advice if someone wants to go further. You, once your momentum is going, you need to keep it going. True. And get a good, get a good agent. <laughs> and a good lawyer. <laughs> um, another question we've received is, has there been a dangerous situation that you were in as a reporter? Yes. Um, I mean, that kind of comes with the territory. I, you know, there's a, you know, on when you're a street reporter on any given day, you could be on a homicide scene and, and you're in morning news, you're out in the middle of the night. And, you know, uh, so, you know, but, the, but those, I don't, I didn't never really focus on those. Even um, on September 11th, I didn't, I didn't feel um, in danger. I was, you know, one of the first crews at the Pentagon. We were, and, 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 you know, that's another whole story on how I got the, but I mean, um, I, even then I didn't feel, I didn't really feel in danger. The one single time that I was truly nervous, um, was that following fall when the sniper was out and about in the DC area. And, um, after there was a, a, a couple series of shootings and, um, you know, we're looking for the white box van and all that, you know, all that stuff that wasn't what we needed to be looking for. Um, but I don't know if you live in the area, you might remember um, there was a child in Bowie that was shot by the sniper. Um, that child didn't die, but he, he, he was shot. And then they were having this correspondence. The sniper was leaving notes and they were having this correspondence with Chief Moose and everything. And, and they said that they were going to target the media and that the next person shot was gonna be a media person. And so we went through this whole thing and uh, training at the station because, you know, so I was out in the field then. And so, you know, you're doing a live shot at, you know, 530 in the morning in the dark, and then you turn on a light, right? They, so that they can see you. And so I very vividly remember my photographer and I, we would stay in the car and then they would tell, you know, we'd have our IFB and they'd say, okay, Holly, you're coming up in two minutes. We would wait till the two minute mark. When they gave us the two minute, we would run out there. And then when the anchor was literally in the intro was the only time that we would turn the light on and we would do our report and then turn it off and run back to the car. And just in that time that you were doing the report and you were just out there and, you know, and you were always at, at that, at this point, we were out at that school, which is why I remember that one, you know, at that point, you're just out there. And you know, the sniper was who at that time, we didn't know who, where the sniper was hiding behind or whatever. And so that's the only time that I really, really felt nervous. Wow, understandably. Well, I would be remiss if I also didn't ask you that the current terrible situation we've been in for the past nine plus months is this pandemic. And how has it affected your career and your audience? You know, um, you know the way you've worked, and uh, you were working from home, weren't you? Not for a good number of months. So I can honestly say, in in my entire career, I never thought I would anchor the news from my home. I didn't ever think that was even an option. I also didn't really think that at this point in my career that I would experience something so totally different than what I had been doing for so many decades, right? Like, so how different could my my job really be? Um, well, it's not anything like what I have done for the past ever how many decades. Um, it has affected my career greatly in terms of just the logistics of my job, right? So um, there's so much, like everybody that's done via Zoom, um, but also even at my station now, only about um, maybe about a fifth of the staff is actually in back at the station. Um, we, I don't really have much interaction with people at, at all. Um, I'm on TV with people, but I don't actually see those people, even though it seems like we're there, we're all at the station, but we're, you know, separate but together and so um it's because i'm in my little 
spot down in the newsroom and no, I'm the only talent down there. Other talent is up in different parts of the studio. Um, you know, like everybody, we have to do the tests every morning. I show a little thing to the guard to show that, you know, I don't have COVID when I go in. And then um, it, there's one door we can go in, all, all the doors and the are one directional, the hallways are one directional. The only time I cannot have a mask on is when I'm on the air or when I'm actually at my own personal desk. But if I get up to walk anywhere or whatever, you have to have a mask on. Um, it's just a really uh, bizarre dynamic. And I will say the other thing, and this is good and bad, is that, um, you know, we have no guests. We don't, no one comes to the station. There's no live person that you actually talk to. Everything is done via Zoom. Um, the good thing about that is that it really gives you access to a lot more people because people are more willing to do interviews than ever because they just go down to their living room or whatever and turn on their camera. So we've talked to a lot of big name stars and stuff that we would never have gotten to talk to because it's just so easy for people to do it. So but, you know, we don't have chefs coming in the kitchen and cooking anymore. You know, none of that happens. They do it from their kitchen via Zoom. And so that's been really interesting and different. And I will be interested to see how that once things start to return to normal, how that returns. Will people still come in in person or is it so much easier? And, you know, the other interesting thing is that now people are okay with with like bad TV. Like if you're, if you're in a Zoom call and it's going in and out, you're accepting of it. You're like, oh, it's just a bad wireless connection or whatever. And you know, before we were all into like high def and it had to be the perfect shot and like, yeah. had to be great. and now we're really fine when TV looks bad. Yeah, like my hair looks kind of like weird, like ah. <laughs> and you're all understanding because you know what virtual backgrounds are like if you don't have a green screen. <laughs> So we received another question, and thank you again, Holly, for staying past 5.30. Someone wanted to know what was the most memorable on-air blooper that you can laugh about now? Oh, I laughed about it then. I mean, you know, you can't talk for a living and be on TV for seven hours and think that you're going to nail it every single time. It just, it just doesn't happen. I think one of the, uh, but one of the funniest was the and I don't even know if it'll translate as, as funny as much, but we were out at Mount Vernon and um, we were doing this live shot of about um, these horses that walked around and they ground the grain and, you know, George Washington made whiskey and, you know, all that, whatever, this was some old story. And these girls were dressed up in period wear and everything. And <laughs> we're, we're doing the live shot well, the horses got away from the girls and all of a sudden the horse came charging at me and I got so startled. But then I also saw my photographer's eyes and his eyes got so big and the horses came by and he's laughing. And I see like the camera, like it's shaking on his shoulder. I can see that he's laughing. I'm laughing. And then these girls go running out into the field to try to get these horses. And in the middle of this field, it's like this period is like our live truck just there and it was it, it just was this crazy scene it was just a, it was a, it was and I didn't recover I laughed I was like I'm oh sorry my God. I'm sure and everyone in the audience was laughing too I can't stop laughing and and my all of most of my bloopers I mean you know you, anybody has misspoken and said some a curse word you know like something that sounds like a curse word I should right. say that, that you know and you get tickled or whatever but um most of my biggest bloopers have been when something has happened and i start laughing and i can't stop oh too funny <laughs> let's see we had um another question is there a broadcast you remember the most fondly that you think will always stay with you that you have that you haven't meant because you've told us so many great stories already but mm -hmm. an additional like day that you said this is going to be one I always remember so you know so here's the great thing about working in Washington and this is what I say all the time is um well working in news first and foremost you constantly have a front row seat to history all the time and, and which is is pretty amazing 
but especially so here in Washington. And my list could go on and on of special days. One of the things I do like about my station is that we are really good at continuing coverage. And when something happens, we'll stick with it and cover it. But so like the most recent example would be the, the, the funerals for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Right. So all of a sudden, these amazing ceremonies are happening, you know, one of the Supreme Court and then a couple of days later, you know, in the in the in the house and in, in the Capitol building, rather. And so when you see things like that, when the, it's a presidential funeral or inauguration day or, you know, just all of those things that happen here in Washington that are ceremonial and they're so significant, all of those are just amazing. Uh, but, but, and I mentioned this before, but at the same time, like, experiencing the Nats winning the World Series was just second to none. I mean, this and, and when that happened, what it did for this city, I mean, in a time when the city was so divided and nobody likes each other and, you know, there was just so much hate out there, it brought DC together and people were just happy, right? And I mean, the Nats weren't, they, they beat the odds, they weren't supposed to win and people were just happy and so just to be a part of that sentiment was super memorable and I, I remember so vividly like taking my son down to the parade right and so the parade's happening and uh, the players are coming with the trophy and everything and I remember thinking at that moment because you know so I'm from Cincinnati and my husband's from Texas and so you know no matter even though I lived in Washington for all these many years you know, my home teams are your home teams, right? They're, they're the teams you grew up with. So I'm a Bengals fan. I mean, Lord, you got to be from Cincinnati to be a Bengals fan, right? But I mean, you know, and I'm a Reds fan and, you know, my husband's a Cowboys fan. And, you know, so I remember looking at my son and he was so excited to see the players and, you know, do the whole, and I thought, you know what? This is the moment right now where, the Nats will always be his baseball team. Like no matter where he moves and where he goes, his heart will, he will always be a Washington Nationals fan. And so just to, you know, those kind of days where you get to be a, a part of the coverage of that, because again, you get special access. So you get to celebrate it maybe even a little more than just the regular person. Those are the days that I remember. That's wonderful. Thank you. We have so many questions. Holly, are you okay with? Oh yeah, it's fine. Okay. So someone asked about um, home studio setups. When you were working from home during the pandemic, did they have someone like from the, well, you're an engineer, so you probably knew everything, but did they have people bring equipment for you and show you how to use it? Or like, were, were there things that you really figured out or you told the Fox 5 staff, I think it should be this way. Like, how did it actually work where you were, you know, broadcasting from your home office? So this was one of those times where they had me go first because I could figure it out with help. I, I, I mean, I had help. I don't want to take a hundred percent of the credit, but a big part of my help was my husband and my son, if I'm being totally honest with you. So that, you know, things were rationing up pretty quickly. And they said, Holly, would you be willing to anchor from home first? And, and they too were figuring it out, right? Like, so how do we do this? How, how do we set it up? And so um, my husband and I worked through the process and we had an engineer on the phone from the station helping us kind of connect things up, but it literally then it's better now, but in the beginning it took, um, five devices. I had my, um, desktop computer. I had a laptop computer. So my desktop computer had the, um, like the rundown and all the software for me to access whatever would be on my computer at the station. Um, my laptop computer in front of me was my, um, prompter. Then I had an iPad that, no, that's not true. I'm sorry. My iPad was the Zoom that gave me feedback so that I could see what was on TV. So my iPad was that. My husband's, or my laptop rather, my husband's iPad was my prompter 
So um, they could dial up the prompter via a Zoom. And then my iPhone, my personal iPhone was my actual camera where there was an app on it with, with, that was called like Live View where they could dial in my shot every day. And then my work cell phone was my IFB. So I could dial in to that. And all of those things had to work in concert to make it happen. And my son, because things weren't at the right height, like the, the prompter, the iPad had to be just above like where the camera was so that you would, you know, you probably felt this in a Zoom. Like if you look at yourself, then you're not looking at the camera, right? So, right? Okay. So it, it had to be just below it so I could fake it enough that I was looking at the prompter, but it would look like I was looking at the camera. So my my um, son, an engineer at heart, Duke class of um, 2034, I mean, <laughs> um, he, uh, he had to, he built out of a box, a stand just the right height. So everything would line up just perfectly. But then they would have people like a, a photographer would come and drop drop lights off and stuff. But remember back at that time when the pandemic was really crazy, you know, people, no one was coming in your house, right? right? And they were wiping stuff off. And, um, and so it, it was a real effort to get that all together. It's interestingly enough, I actually just had a meeting today with um, our, the news director have with the talent and they, you know, they're because the numbers are rising and we don't know, you know, the steps that are going to happen. Are we going to have to come back and be in the situation to anchor again from home? It's a possibility. They're getting ready for that. They're not saying that's going to happen, but they're preparing for that. And so they bought a whole bunch of um, equipment to help make the home studios better than what they were in the beginning when we were just figuring it out. Wow. Incredible. Well, a Duke engineering degree definitely helped you with the pandemic. <laughs> so again, bringing it back to Duke and, and reaching a closure, because we, you need to get to bed, Holly, soon. And I know a lot of people have things starting at six. But what is your favorite way of being engaged with Duke? And what advice do you have for alumni who aren't so engaged? Well, my favorite way to be engaged at Duke, it just generally speaking, is just to go back and be on campus, right? Um, there, it's, it, there's just a no, no better space, in, in my, my opinion. My favorite um, activity that I do where I really feel like I'm, I'm involved is, is the Board of Visitors for the Pratt School of Engineering. Um, I really cherish that time, um, just not only because I get to obviously understand, um, you know, what's going on more in tune with what's really going on at the engineering school and how it's changing and moving forward and how they're addressing different things, but I really just cherish the interaction with the other board members. Um, I feel uh, just so amazed when I leave those meetings that I get to be in the company of such accomplished, smart people. <laughs> there, you know, it, it, it's it's so great to see what those people have gone on and done with their lives and the in, interesting things. The conversations that are had um, are just fabulous. And um, you know, it doesn't hurt to go to a Duke basketball game either. I mean, you know, that's pretty fun. <laughs> it is, but Aren't now it? it's just virtual. You yeah, get right. to see yeah. the pictures of the audience on the on the. Right. <laughs> but I would say this about anybody that's not involved, if you're a Duke alum, um, there are so many ways and opportunities for you to do things um, with Duke, for Duke. Um, they love their alumni and they cherish uh, any input that you have and they, they, they really do listen and um, they get as much from you as you will get from them. I mean, I, you know, my uh, mother-in-law is on this because she's one of my number one supporters. So I will give her a shout out because I know that she is here watching <laughs> from New York. Um, but I know that, you know, she also, she's on a, on a board. She's on the Nicholas School of the Environment Board, but she's done um, some of the Duke trips 
you know, she's traveled and, and she always just talks so greatly about, about them. And so there's just so many different opportunities. Um, really, it's up to you to take advantage of it. And Duke loves having you. So. Totally agree. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you for sharing your time and insights with us. Now, everyone, be sure to wake up early weekday mornings to watch Holly on Fox 5 and follow her on her social media accounts. Also, please save February 11th for our next Duke DC Career Conversations with Nora Gardner, Managing Director of McKinsey's DC office. Thank you everyone for attending our first Duke DC Career Conversation, which I hope you have enjoyed. We doubled the time that it is for Duke New York. And thank you again, Holly, for our wonderful time together. The recording of this session. Oh, Holly, I got this. Yeah. <laughs> These are um, my real uh, pom poms from Duke. That I mean, is too much. Yeah. Are you gonna, can don't you do a little cheer for us too? Later, and don't act like you're surprised. Ooh, too funny. Uh, so that will also be, I hope, on the recording of this session, available with other interviews of Duke alumni working in creative industries on the Demon Live episodes page and at the wonderful Duke DC page. The links will also be added to the chat. I also wanna give a special thanks to Louise Meyer for all her hard work behind the scenes, which made this event today possible. I'm wishing everyone and their families a happy and a healthy holiday season and go Duke. Holly, let's have those pom-poms one more time. Okay. Bye, everybody. And thank you so much. This was so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you.